Welcome back to the channel folks and to another tutorial. This tutorial it's for the new Yard Tiger kit but you can use what I'm showing you here in all of the Flames of War kits. Basically it's going to be about weathering. Now I've chosen the Yard Tiger as an example because it's a big chunky kit where, where we can really get our teeth into the subject. I'm not going to show you the painting of the Yard Tiger itself. There's plenty of other videos out there on the channel check out the King Tiger video um, with the most recent one for airbrushing. But anyway, let's get stuck in and show you how I got this nice weathered but hopefully subtle look on these lovely new Yard Tiger kits. Here are the subjects for this weathering video. These are chunky flat sided Yard Tigers with a big chunky camo. So there's something that would really benefit from some nice weathering. Now you can see I have already airbrushed these guys with the soft edge three tone camo. I'm using my normal palette of colours here which is Tamiya Dark Yellow 2, NATO Green and Red Brown. Now I've already washed them and varnished them. The wash has been applied with an acrylic wash from MIG. Meg ammo. I call it a pin wash. If I, if, if I say that guy, guys don't go looking for acrylic pin wash uh, for Meg, just look for their acrylic washes. You can see the bottle there. That should keep you straight. Check out my King Tiger video for airbrushing in action, so to speak. Uh, a bit of an airbrush demo for Ambush Camo. This video is going to be all about the weathering. I'm going to apply the initial weathering at this stage before I paint all the details. The wash is already in place and if the weathering obscures any of the wash I can easily tidy that up. But I want to make big, big long wide strokes with the weathering so it's better to do it now rather than to apply those strokes over all the detailing. And I forgot to do it in this case but it wasn't a problem for me. You should have your decals on before you apply the streaking too because then it'll be nice and weathered down with it. Let's get started with the uh, dusty streaky lines that we're going to put all over this thing. Now I'm putting some water onto this palette here. Uh, just a little bit of water to work with. And then I have one of these acrylic washes. This is a dust wash. Now you've got to shake this bottle nice and hard folks and it'll come out relatively thick for a wash. If I was going to be applying a pin wash I would thin it down on the palette and then apply it to all the various panel lines and other kind of details. You don't need much here at all folks, a tiny little amount will go a very long way. So we're going to be using this straight out the bottle unthinned. You can see it's nice and thick. The reason we're going to be doing that is because we want to put little blobs of this paint on the hull and then draw it down. If it's thin when we draw it down it's going to become very watery and it's going to be harder to create that misty look because it'll look quite like condensation almost. So we're using two brushes, this big thick brush to do the drawing so to speak and a little thin brush to do the initial application of the wash. Now it's very important with the, the broad brush that it's only damp. You can't have it wet, if it's wet it'll just spread the wash all over. So get a, a, a little bit of water on it, take most of it off and then I just rub it across my finger or thumb until it doesn't leave any, any little, little puddles, any little bubbles of water. Now apologies folks, I managed to get my head in the way quite a lot in this um, part of the video. Uh, anyway, here we go, you can see I have loaded a little bit of the wash onto the thin brush. And I'm now going to dot it around where I want the stronger streaks to be. And that's the starting point. Quickly clean that brush just to get the wash off it. And then we're going to go to the big brush, make sure it's prepared. And we're going to start drawing it down using the width of the brush. And as you can see, we're now creating streaks, which we can then move on to work. We can turn the brush sideways. Also we can clean it as well as we're going folks if we're picking up too much paint on it and then see turn it sideways and start to refine these streaks. We're not looking for like how to put it like prison bar streaks here folks. We want 
to just have some streaks that are a little bit stronger and then a dusty covering over the whole side. And we're going to be doing this all over the side, not just on the taller areas. But I shall go to speed it up now and so we can crack through this, but you can see it being repeated across the whole vehicle. Larger areas are probably going to require a couple of passes, so to speak, where you're going to go in and maybe add a few more dots, draw them down a bit. Now this wash remains workable for quite some time. I would say if you want to remove anything you've got put on, then just really load the brush with water. Not to the point where it's completely flooding the whole vehicle because you'll cover areas that you don't want to remove perhaps, but if it's nice and wet, and you're working it as soon as you've got the, the wash in there, the streaks ran down, then you, sh you can still remove anything that you don't want. And remember folks, it is still going to be possible to come back once we've painted all the detailing to accentuate any areas of weathering that we feel need a little bit more attention. You know, so you might think, okay, that area needs a, just a little streak, maybe a little dark streak, as well as a light streak. So you have the chance to go back. Don't try to do everything at once at this stage. Our intention here is to create a slightly streaky, maybe a little bit more streaky in some areas, but for a regularity, but slightly streaky and dusty surface. Now on the flat areas, we're going to dot some of the wash around and then we're going to take our big broad brush and just move it around, dot it, speckle it, you know, and get a bit of a regular dusting in there and it'll just help keep the same finish on the flat surfaces as on the, um, the vertical surfaces without streaking because there's not going to be any streaking on the flat surfaces, just an accumulation. We have to remember to dust the barrel too, so place a little dots along the top of the barrel and then draw it down each side. Remember not to draw all the paint down one side so there's nothing to draw down the other and take the same approach as a hull and you'll get a nice dusty look. Hopefully this doesn't look like a daunting uh, process for you folks. The most important thing to remember, the biggest danger is not to overdo it. We're creating a streaky dusty patina that is the starting point for our weathering. This is not the finished product and you don't want it to look too regular as well folks. The next stage of the weathering is going to be applied over the top of the dusting, which is counterintuitive. You'd expect the dusting to be over everything, but because we are painting a tiny little 1 100 scale tank, it makes sense to do this in this particular order. So chipping and scratching is a process that can easily be overdone again. We're trying to add to the patina here and also when I'm applying my chipping and scratching we're also going to use it as part of the highlighting process. 
I'm starting with sponge chipping because that is the finest part of this process, finest as in smallest areas. Now you have to be very careful when you are sponge chipping. It's very easy to go completely over the top, I apologise for my head, coming into shot there again folks. Make sure you've only got a tiny little amount of paint on your sponge. Make sure it's a small bit of sponge that is going to be applied only to those areas, to those edges, to those panels that you want it to be applied to. Make sure your paint is a little bit thinner than it comes out of the bottle. Then dab your sponge into it just a little bit, you know, keep it flat. Don't dab it into a like a deep pool of paint. Keep it flat, dab it in and then a bit of tissue or something, take most of the paint off the sponge and then sometimes even I will try it on my thumb just to be confident. Then apply it to where you want in the tank and there should be only enough paint on your sponge to do a small area. You're then going to repeat the process. So you're constantly refreshing and removing paint from the sponge so you've got lots of good control. I should say the colour I'm using is Iraqi sand. That is a good chipping colour for the dark yellow base colour. It represents lighter areas of paint that have been exposed under A, the camo colours and B, the darkened outer surface of the dark yellow and that is going to be the light chips. So folks, what we're doing here is creating a worn look where this light paint surface has become visible under the main surface. Let's stop and take a look at how things are. You can see with the streaking and with the chipping that the whole surface is becoming softer and more weathered. Hopefully here when you see this comparison of the two you can really get an idea of what it is we're aiming to achieve. The next stage of the chipping process is some edge highlighting. I'm using the Iraqi sand again and a brush which is a bit beat up because this process can be quite uh, wearing on your brushes. So what I'm doing here is I'm hitting all the edges with the flat of the brush, creating a highlight whilst at the same time creating areas of more pronounced chipping. Now this isn't about drawing a line all the way along all the edges because as I said this is part of chipping. So you can create a highlight on an edge with a broken line. It does not have to go all the way along the edge. On a kit such as this with so much in the way of hatches and panels and everything else, this can be quite a time consuming process folks. But it's not one that should be rushed because you're going to end up with lines that are getting too big, too thick and that's going to spoil the overall look. The fenders are a nice clear example of what we're trying to achieve. See we want to be able to see the the shape of the fenders. So we also want to create some wear and tear. So we put a chip all the way along that line, but it's chip, 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 chip. It's not a big long line. And that, as part of this process, remember folks, creates a highlight, but at the same time, chipping. Next, we're going to create some scratches, different from chipping and that they're going to be long lines as opposed to little blotches. Now, this is an area which once again can be overdone. It's very easy to cover the whole thing in scratches, especially because I've already applied chips so that the, the tank ends up looking like it's actually from a scrapyard. And, you know, we're, we're doing this chipping for weathering, for breaking up panels, for adding to shape on edges you know, to help create contrast. We don't want to go too far and end up, as I said, creating a scrap heap. Mm -hmm. 
Make sure your paint is thin enough to flow easily off the brush so that you can make very very light contact with the surface and with a bit of practice you'll be able to uh, paint a line which is kind of imagine a little bit thicker and thinner at various points to create an irregular scratch. And be patient. As part of all these processes, if you feel as though you're getting nowhere and you're ready to start rushing through, then you're going to be going too fast and you're going to end up with an unsatisfactory result. So if it is getting on your wick, folks, just set it aside. Come back to it when you're feeling fresher. Final stage for the chipping is to create a, a dark sort of core to the larger chips and scratches to represent exposed metal that's gone a bit rusty and I use German Camo dark brown for that and a brush which is either very thin or got a very fine point and we're going to be going across the surface we have just chipped and placing little lines along these scratches or little dots into the chips. Now this is quite a fine process folks you know because the chips and scratches themselves are not very big and that is why it's important to have a very fine point on your brush and to have the paint at the proper mix so that it flows easily off your brush but then stays within the confines of the lighter chip that you've created with the Iraqi sand. Contrast is an important thing to remember when you're doing this too folks. For instance if I have a light chip or a light scratch in the red brown camo blotches unless it's oversized I'm not going to put a core of German camo black brown into that because it will just disappear likewise the chips are going to look stronger in the dark yellow sections so it's important to, to use the German camo black brown sufficiently to tone things down there and then the, the scratch or chip will therefore become more visible and remember folks, on a light edge, a dark paint will stand out, which will actually help create contrast. It might sound, you know, like counterintuitive to use a dark colour as a highlight, but if you've got a nice, clear, German um, dark yellow edge, you can make it stand out stronger by putting a few dark chips on it. We're nearly there for the weathering folks but before we come to the final stages I'm going to have to paint all of the detail that's there on these kits and they're quite busy. You know you've got exhaust, you've got um, the jack, you've got uh, uh, pioneer tools, you've got towing cables, all of them have to be painted. You know, they're, they're quite demanding kits in many ways um, these yard tigers but I'm going to do all that and then come back to show you the final stages. So you can see I've painted all the detail, as you can see it has quite a lot going on there. If you try to do overall weathering at this point with the detail on you can see how it would be tricky to work around all of those little pieces. But now it's time to do just a few specific spots of streaking. Areas where we want to accentuate the streak a little and areas where maybe it's just not consistent enough and we just want to soften things down a bit but we don't want to go over the top once again. So I'm really just going to be repeating the same processes here as we did before and just taking care not to hit the the uh, little bits of detail, the, the cables and such like that you can see there. So it's literally just a few streaks each side and remember folks it's about accentuating here. We don't want to make things too strong. We just want to have a few stronger lines of streaking to catch the eye. Mm -hmm. 
for some variety I'm now going to add a few dark spots not too many folks here and then draw them down in the same way as we did before and this can be quite a strong um, look especially when done over the, the lighter areas you know, the, the dark yellow so just be careful we just want to add a little bit of variety here and we don't want to be applying this to the same level as we have for the lighter streaking Now it's back to the airbrush. I want to create a misty, dusty edge, bottom edge, to the, um, in this case to the hull, in other cases to the fenders. And this is just to create a transition almost. It's like this soft area will, the, the weathering will kind of rise up out of it or streak down into it depending on your point of view. But it's a, it's a nice simple process which can add a nice degree of subtlety to the finish. I'm using Panzer Ace's Light Mud here. It's got a nice consistent look across a three-tone camo such as I've used here. You don't want to overdo this folks, it just has to be a misting, that's all you're after here. Just a misty, dusty area, not a solid coat by any stretch. Now for the tracks to put some weathering on, I'm going to use some pigments. I'm using a light, sort of dry earth kind of colour here. And you can see I'm working on a palette, putting some water in, putting some pigments in and then getting the mixture to the right consistency that we need to evenly cover the tracks. If you are not familiar with pigments and don't work with them regularly, be careful not to put on too much. You're not putting on a paste. As you can see here, it's gone on really quite thin and I'm spreading it around. You will know how the finished look is once it's dry and not before. So don't try to put more on because you think there's not enough. It's a lot more easy to put more on once it's dry than it is to take it off once it's dry. Now you'll notice I'm, I'm putting it on the tracks themselves, the treads of the tracks, I'm not putting it on the wheels. I've already weathered them and I do have a specific video about weathering wheels folks. I, I'll, I'll put a link at the end of this video to that. This is just about getting a bit of colour into the, the tracks and a bit of definition, a little bit of shape by using a light pigment against the dark colour of the track links themselves. Once the pigment is dry, you can go back to the uh, tracks and then clear any flat areas that through wear and tear wouldn't have any pigment on them, wouldn't have any earth on them, and then just try and even things up and maybe draw any pigment away from the rims of the wheels where it tends to gather unrealistically. Adding mud to the weathering can be a brave or sometimes bad decision to make but I'm going to do it here um, for the purpose of this video and you can see the, uh, the product I'm using, it's a Villagio dedicated product, it's got a nice gritty grainy look to it when it dries. Now you want to be keeping your application of mud 
to the minimum, shall we say. You want to put it where it would naturally gather, like in the backs of the, um, the, the tracks here on the sides in this case, but not on the sides of fenders, folks. Remember, fenders keep the mud inside. If you've got mud on the outside of fenders or shoes in, that would suggest that the mud, the, the mud is deep enough when the tank's driving through it for it to reach that level. I'm using an old brush for this folks, you know, it's well past its best, there's almost no hairs left on it. I'm going to think carefully about where I'm going to put some mud. So I'm going to put some near the front where the, the track is whipping back around as it's driving forward, so to speak. And you can see how little I'm putting on here. You, you've got to keep it in scale as much as you can. And then some at the back where the uh, track once again is whipping back underneath the hull. And then just a few spots along the edges here. We don't want to just put mud all the way along because it's a bit oppressive looking, you know. So just a few spots that are going to catch the eye. And I'm going to do a treatment once this is dry as well, folks, um, to help this stand out a little more against the hull. Where the fenders are missing on the rear, I'm going to put a, a nice thick lump there. You know, that's, there's a lot of activity at the back of a tank, you know, when, when a, a track is crawling its way forward, it's chucking a lot of earth, a lot of mud onto these areas. And I'm also going to do the bottom of the hull, just in case it's uh, bottomed out, so to speak. And I'm going to do that on the front of the hull too. It's a bit, bit of a heavy kind of weathering, but it's worthwhile doing for the purposes of this demo. With the exception of the rear, where I've put it on quite thick, all the other areas I want to be putting on quite thin. You now you can lump it on initially, but then draw it off. So you're just creating a gritty, muddy surface. Leave that to dry for a day, and then add a little touch of pigment powder, such as the light pigment we've already used, and that'll really help it stand out from the rest of the hull. And that is us done, folks. I hope you found this interesting and useful. If you did so, please like and um, consider subscribing. I'd like to thank all the people who are subscribing to the channel. It helps us develop the channel further and, and bring these kind of tutorials um, and content about Flames of War that you know people enjoy. You know, it brings it to YouTube and YouTube spreads the Flames of Word knowledge out there if you guys are shown it's the kind of thing you're interested in. So I'll leave you to have a look at some more stills folks and thanks again for watching, hit the bell button and I'll see you all on the next one.